This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public Radio app to listen on your iPhone or Android phone on demand. From MPB Think Radio, this is Creature Comforts. It's the show all about your animals and the animals around you. Kevin Farrell here with Dr. Troy Major, veterinarian at the Animal Medical Center in Jackson. Libby Hartfield, the retired director of the Mississippi Museum of Natural Science, is out this week. So here we are in the middle of August. Summer's winding down, but southbound migratory birds have been participating in fall migration since mid-July. Today, Joe McGee's back to tell us what birds to look for during the migration season and how to spot the always elusive swallow-tailed kite. Dr. Major's here ready for your pet questions. To join your, uh, our conversation this morning, just give us a call. The number is one eight seven seven mpb ring It's one eight seven seven. 672-7464. You can email animals at mpbonline.org. Remind you that if you miss Creature Comforts on Thursday morning, it repeats Saturday mornings at 6. So good morning, Joe. Thanks uh, for coming in this morning. You know, we always talk about frogs, snakes, and insects uh, when you visit. Today, we're going to focus uh, some on the birds of Mississippi. Before we get into that, though, Libby left you a message about an upcoming event at the museum. That's right. She did. This coming Saturday... August 21st, day after tomorrow, there's an event at the museum called All About Falconry. It will take place in the museum's uh, Rotwein Theater. You can meet and greet uh, falconers, hopefully at least one falconer, maybe several. It's, the event starts at 10 a.m. and goes till noon. Once again, it's at the museum in Jackson. Uh, it'll be an opportunity to see a red-tailed hawk up close and personal. For sure, they're promising a red-tailed hawk. Maybe a Harris's hawk. Now, that would be a good opportunity to see a Harris's hawk because it's not native to Mississippi. You won't find one in the wild in the state. So a good chance possibly to see a Harris's hawk, a big chocolate brown hawk, uh, a little bit larger than our, our, our common red-shouldered hawk. Uh, you'll have an opportunity to join uh, Mississippi's Falconry Club if you want to, after you talk to the falconers uh, and hear stories of uh, their adventures out in the field with falcons or hawks. And uh, just get, get your questions about falconry answered uh, by professional falconers. If you want more information, you can call the museum at 601-576-6000 and ask for uh, Nicole Smith or uh, Simon Robbins okay. at, at the museum. Uh, we had a falconer on this show years ago and actually brought a bird of prey into the studio with him. And, man, again, I've, and I've said this several times on the air, but those birds, it's just when you see them up close like that, just the the power in in their, you know, their the way they flap their wings and everything. When that bird started wing flapping, papers were fly, flying off the table. Yes, I can imagine. Yes. <laughs> so it's uh, I would encourage folks. Uh, that sounds like a really great uh, event coming up at the museum uh, this Saturday from 10 until noon. So, uh, Dr. Major is on the line with us. Good morning, Dr. Major. Hope you're doing well this morning. Good morning. Uh, we're doing fine. Uh, there's noise in the background, as always. Uh, <laughs> dogs are excited this morning. But uh, anyway, it's good being on the show. Well, you know, if we didn't hear the dogs, we would know that things aren't going. So that's a sign that the clinic is, is up and humming every day, I guess. <laughs> it, it absolutely is, yes. A couple of pet uh, questions here, one of which is a bit sure. unusual, but we'll start with this one. It says, I have signs of deer coming into my yard. I don't know what could be attracting it. So far, it hasn't hasn't eaten my garden. Uh, my question is, with the deer disease, is there any risk for cats and dogs getting sick? It's a great question. As far as we know, the answer is no, your cats and dogs are not going to get sick from the deer coming in the yard. We have a, what shall I say, and Joe can attest to this, I'm sure, an abundance of deer uh, in our urban areas. Uh, and sooner or later, I'm sure they'll find something, if there's a garden or whatever, if they'll find something to eat. <laughs> but uh, as far as the, the uh, cats and dogs catching something from these deer, I would say no. All right, here's another one. And uh, Java and I were talking about this yesterday, wondering whether you could answer it. And we figured, what the heck, we'll, we'll give it a shot. But it says... <laughs> I have three chickens. One was isolated recently due to an infection requiring antibiotics. When the chicken came out of isolation, the other two chickens attacked it. They've continued to bully her and will not let her eat. Uh, 
first of all, do you, do you have any experience with chickens? And if so, uh, any idea whether this bullying behavior among the chickens will pass? Gosh, that's an even greater question. Uh, <laughs> having had experience with uh, some, actually some uh, birds myself, both pheasants and and chickens, uh, they sense sometimes weakness, uh, and maybe this uh, chicken has a different smell. And I would keep this chicken isolated if, if it's going to survive. But they can be quite vicious uh, if they decide to, uh, uh, what shall I say, attack another bird of their in their group. But uh, I know in raising pheasants that uh, if any pheasant showed weakness, uh, the other pheasants would attack it. Hmm. So I guess my point is it may have a different smell. It may still be sick, and uh, I would keep it isolated still, okay? Okay, so maybe some more isolation. Uh, and the tricky part here would be, I guess, because we don't know what's sort of keying the other chickens. It might be difficult to kind of figure out when, when, you know, when the situation has resolved itself. So, But at least uh, you're saying for the short term, probably more isolation is the best bet. Yes. All right, this is Creature Comforts on MPB Think Radio. Our guest, as we mentioned this morning, uh, is a friend of the program. Uh, Joe, we pr- always appreciate you. And before we get into the migration, I wanted to ask you about, um, I think I've mentioned on, on the air before, I'm a big fan of vultures. Uh, and d- there's two kinds, I think. There's the turkey vultures and the black vultures. That's right. Do we have the black vultures here in Mississippi? Yes, we have them in Jackson, in fact. Okay. They're the ones that you often see perched on uh, the billboards mm-hmm. coming in on the on the interstate. Uh, sometimes in fairly large numbers. But, yeah, we have both vultures in the state. I saw several uh, black vultures just a couple of days ago, and I stopped my vehicle and eased the window down. And actually, it was already down. And tried. And I got a few, a couple of photographs, but they're very wary birds. There was probably a dead animal. I didn't see the carcass, but uh, th- there must have been a dead animal there that had attracted them. So um, I read on online yesterday that in, I think it was in Indiana, that they are becoming a real problem because they don't eat just carry-on, that the, but they'll attack small creatures. And so farmers are saying that, you know, if there's a, a calf or something that appears to be a little bit vulnerable, that they are, are subject to uh, being attacked and, and killed by these, uh, by these uh, uh, black vultures. Um, the other thing I thought was interesting, and so the the point of the article was they were protected by a migratory bird agreement, but that they are now allowing uh, certain farmers, if they have a plan and limit the amount of vultures that they kill, that they can c- try to cull the population. Uh, the interesting thing was that they said that when you kill them, you take the carcass of one of the dead ones and sort of hang it up, and the other birds, I think, <laughs> get the idea that maybe they should go elsewhere. And stay away. <laughs> the, the same thing is in effect in Mississippi. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, black vultures will attack a calf that's just been born if there's no humans around. Now, humans frighten them, frighten them away. It's very difficult, actually, to get a good photograph of a, of a black vulture, and certainly a turkey vulture. They're even shyer than the black vultures. Uh, but, yeah, if there are no people around, they are hungry birds, and they can kill a, a newborn calf, one that's just been born. Uh, I grew up on a dairy farm, and it was never a problem. Our cows had their calves out in a pasture, but there was a lot of human, you know, toing and froing, if you will. And so it was never a problem. The vultures will eat the placenta. if the cow, You know, a cow will eat her own placenta if, if she's given an opportunity uh, to keep predators away, that's thought to be uh, an adaptation to keeping predators away or scavengers away. But uh, the black vultures will eat that if if humans don't frighten the frighten them away. Uh, but yeah, miss it, miss it, beef cattle, people who raise beef cattle can apply for the permits. You can't just go out and do it without. You have to jump through a few hoops mm-hmm. first from the Fish and Wildlife Service to to do that but they yeah they can be a problem i hate to hear that because i kind of like them <laughs> yeah to, to me they're I, I don't know what is it about the, the the right word to describe them but something about the way they look and act i think it, to me is really fascinating and they do they do a good uh, a service to the rest of us by eating That's up right. all those dead animals. they keep the carcasses <laughs> off the off the road uh i actually can tell when there's when an animal has been killed in front of my house i live on a fairly busy highway i hear horns blowing and it's people you know, shooing the black vultures away, and possibly even turkey vultures, uh, because they don't want to hit one. It'll it can damage your windshield. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, that's, they're not necessarily interested in protecting the vultures. They're protecting their windshield. <laughs> but I get out with my shovel and move it off the road. And if the hay has been cut behind my house and the grass is really short, I just put the, you know, the dead rabbit or the dead armadillo, whatever, possum, whatever, out there. And they, pretty soon they return and it's, every fragment is gone. Every, every fiber of that animal is gone yeah. in a little while. Yeah, it's amazing. And I think I heard once, I don't know if it was you on, on the show or someone that we might have had that they can, like, eat windshield i mean they'll attack cars and eat eat things off of a car what like windshield wipers and that sort of thing i i don't know okay maybe i i, I didn't i didn't tell that story <laughs> i've never seen that happen i don't know why they would i i don't know okay well i'm that, somehow in my mushed brain i think i might have maybe add a little bit of uh, fantasy to what i heard but that's uh interesting and it's interesting too that that same sort of uh uh, you know, program for farmers to kind of uh, controlled culling of the herd, I guess, is going on here in Mississippi as well. So uh, it's time for the first break of the hour. When we get back, we'll be talking about birds with our guest for the day, Joe McGee. If you have a question about migratory birds or a pet question for Dr. Major, you can give us a call. The number is one eight seven seven mpb ring It's one eight seven seven six seven two seven four six four. Email animals at mpbonline.org. Stay tuned. We'll be back with more after this. Hey, this is Larry Morrissey with the Mississippi Arts Commission. I'm one of the hosts of the Mississippi Arts Hour, the arts interview show on Think Radio. Each week, myself or one of my fellow hosts bring you in-depth interviews with different creative Mississippians. We talk with visual artists, musicians, writers, as well as people who help bring the arts to their communities. We hear about how each artist learned their craft and get some insight into their creative process. You can hear the Arts Hour every Sunday at 5 p.m. on Think Radio. Or listen anytime by subscribing to the show through your favorite podcasting app. This is Creature Comforts on MPB Think Radio. Kevin Farrell here with Dr. Troy Major. And our guest for the day, biologist Joe McGee. We're talking about fall birds and taking your pet questions. If you want to join our conversation with a question or a comment, give us a call. The number is 1-877-MPB-RING. It's one 877 Six seven two seven four six four. You can email animals at mpbonline dot org. And since we talked a bit about uh, the black vultures, if uh, you've had an experience and encounter with them recently, uh, you can call and let us know. We always like to hear about those wildlife experiences that you have when you're out and about enjoying uh, Mississippi's uh, natural resources. So, uh, Joe, in the in the opener, we mentioned fall migration has been going on since mid July. Is that right? Well, at least southbound migration, we might not want to call it fall migration since by the calendar fall hasn't begun and won't begin until September. But, yeah, uh, the, those clouds of hummingbirds that folks were seeing around their hummingbird feeders, many of those, in fact, most were migrants. If they had banded all of those birds, say, on Sunday, say they had a dozen ruby-throated hummingbirds banded, by Saturday most of those banded birds would be gone, but they still might have a dozen birds around the feeder. There's turnover, you know, during the week. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, uh, migration has been going on. There's been a report from Oxford already a couple of weeks ago of a black-throated green warbler. Now, that's a little warbler that passes through Mississippi spring and fall, but it does not breed in the state. It, there's no records of it breeding in the state. Breeding in Canada and across New York and, say, northeastern Minnesota, northeastern Wisconsin, nor our northern states, New England. Uh, and yet somebody saw one uh, near Oxford hmm. uh, uh, a couple of weeks ago. So, yeah, migration is taking place. So what uh, types of birds are visiting Mississippi this time of year? Uh, the, the warblers that I just mentioned, the small small land birds. It might be instructive to think about what it was like in late April, say late April and May, when the birds were coming this way, getting ready to breed. Some of them just passing through, others coming to, to stop in our woodlands to uh, nest and, and, you know, raise young. At that time, the woods were just alive with song. Just uh, the, the dawn course was just astounding. It can be astounding if you go to the right woodland. Now you don't hear much of anything because, uh, you know, they don't, the males are not trying to attract a mate anymore. They may still be feeding young uh, that haven't yet uh, left the state, but uh, the woods are pretty quiet. You might hear wrens and chickadees and titmice, but... Uh, those you know are always present in our permanent residence, but the birds that are passing through now, uh, the small songbirds like the the uh, black throated green warbler I mentioned, and something that's really interesting that's passing through right now are the are the vireos, the 
Uh, White-eyed vireo. That's a, if folks don't know that one, it would be a good one to learn because they sing. You know, they sing on migration. Most of our birds become silent. You just hear an occasional chip note uh, on migration or an alarm call, that sort of thing. But white-eyed vireo sing on spring migration. They sing when they're on territory. You know, during the breeding season, and they sing again on fall migration. I heard one this morning as I was getting ready to come over here. Uh, it's a it's a very distinctive s- song, and uh, I bet you. Many of our listeners have heard it. They may not have known what they were hearing because they're hard to see. White-eyed vireo is a is a difficult bird to see. It's a brush bird. It hangs out in uh, brushy woodlands at the edge of woodlands and under power lines that have been, you know, bush hog been cut, but not but not herbicided. Uh, that's the kind of habitat they like. Uh, now I think we have. Um, there we go. So this is the white-eyed vireo. Perfect. All right. <laughs> That's exactly what I heard this morning. But Chip fell out of the white oak? I'm not sure I'm hearing that. <laughs> uh, okay. There's, there are, they, have, there, they actually have a fairly extensive uh, repertoire. Okay. If you can learn the, the quality of the sound of that bird, this is nothing like, say, the, the song of a, a black-throated green warbler. Uh, once you learn the quality of that song, it, you'll recognize it. And sometimes it does say, Chip fell out of the white oak. <laughs> it just sort of, the song just bubbles out. Uh, and it also has the ability ability to imitate other birds. I can remember I was leading a bird walk one time up near Starkville, and uh, we were hearing the white-eyed vireo sing that song that he just played. And if every time the... The, the white-eyed vireo completed its song. At the very end of its song, we heard a summer tanager singing. So I said, oh, there's a summer tanager. And I thought, mm, I don't think so, but let's, let's be sure. And sure enough, the white-eyed vireo was throwing in a few notes of the summer tanager song at the very end of it. So we were not hearing a hmm. summer tanager. We were hearing a white-eyed vireo imitate a summer tanager. Why would it do that? Do we know? I don't know. Uh, I'm not sure we do know. But Just, they have the ability to imitate a number of other birds. I, I'm not sure what the advantage to that to that is. Maybe it's just for fun. Who knows? <laughs> that's the uh, that's the song of the black-throated green warbler, which you would hear in the spring when they when they come through. You probably will not hear that this time of year. It's a high-pitched, thin song, and and the. Many of the warblers stay high up, way up in the trees. They're hard to see. Although in the spring when they first start showing up, sometimes the trees have not completely leafed out or maybe not leafed out at all, and then they are easier to see uh, because you're, you're looking at birds in bare, bare trees. This is Creature Comforts. Today we're visiting with Joe McGee and talking about some of the birds that are uh, migrating through Mississippi this time of year. We've got some open phone lines, so if you want to call in with a question or a comment, maybe you've uh, seen some birds out in your yard that you want to share with us, the number to call is one eight seven seven mpb ring It's one eight seven seven six seven two. 7464. You can have a, a get your pet question answered by Dr. Major this morning as well. So, like I said, some open phone lines. We'd love to hear from you and participate in the program this morning. Kevin, we just got an email from uh, Catherine. You guys were talking about uh, buzzards a little bit earlier, and uh, the email said, My dad used to call them caraway boys. <laughs> this is why I guess this is a pun for you because they carried away the dead stuff. <laughs> So that was her name for the buzzards, All right. Boys. I like that. They eat it, eat it in place or uh, eat it where they find it. Uh, shorebirds are also headed south this time of year. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, when we talk about shorebirds, we're, we're talking about essentially sandpipers. And there are many, many different kinds of sandpipers. And they are some of the first southbound migrants that, that we see. They hang out around ponds and catfish ponds, marshes. Any place that there, there's water, that's usually where you can, can find the shorebirds. And they, the first ones were seen this year uh, in July. Uh, I believe the second week in July, folks were seeing shorebirds up in the delta. They, there's certain catfish ponds that folks have permission to visit and, uh, and see the shorebirds, sometimes in very large numbers. They can be difficult to identify if you're not used to it because uh, they kind of all look alike. They're little brown jobs, as they say. LBJs, little brown jobs. <laughs> but uh, not all of them. There's one called a black stilt, a black neck stilt, which is very distinctive. You you know you know what it is it's the first time you see one. Oh, what about the size? Are these big birds? 
they vary in size from uh, one called a least sandpiper, which is about the size of a sparrow, not much larger than a sparrow, up through uh, a, a bird called a greater yellow legs, which is a good sized bird. Uh, uh, greater yellow legs about the oh I'm, I'm they stand up on, on tall on stilts they're and about the size of a, a blue jay but not shaped like a blue jay stockier than a blue jay and I'm kind of groping for a size comparison here but it's a it's a fairly large uh, shorebird there's one that I bet you most of our listeners have seen and that's the kilder that's actually a shorebird it's a permanent resident they do breed in Mississippi but show up in large numbers uh, this time of year around ponds and marshes and so forth. And, you know, I'm going to mention this before, too, but I feel sorry for a a bird that's named the least something. I mean, what what an ego deflator that must be. (laughs) Yes, there's a least sandpiper and there's a least tern, which, you know, there's a a colony of them that nests on the Gulf Coast, uh, on the sand, sand beach, sandy beaches on the coast. So uh, you mentioned uh, the, uh, the the catfish ponds. So we would also see these shorebirds, obviously, on on the Gulf Coast uh, here in Mississippi. Yeah, they uh, they they hang out. Some of them prefer the sandy beaches. Some uh, prefer mud flats, exposed mud flats, because there's all kind of uh, food in those mud flats. You know, uh, invertebrates that they like to feed on. And so, would we see them at, at lakes also? You can if there's enough shoreline exp- enough exposed shoreline mud flats or you know sandy beach exposed they don't like it where the water runs right up into the vegetation that's just they they can't access the food in in that situation most of them can anyway uh and we'll talk about one other one here before the next break uh wading birds tell us a little bit about those yeah when you're out looking for shore birds you probably will see some of the wading birds and they're the of the birds we've talked about this morning, with exception maybe of the vultures, they are, the wading birds are easy to see. I'm talking about great blue herons, great egrets, little blue herons. You can see those in large numbers this time of year. Uh, snowy egrets, white ibis, and two that are, are really neat to see, and this is the best time of year to see them in Mississippi, the wood stork and the roseate spoonbill. You can see, though, a good place to see those would be St. Catharines Creek National Wildlife Refuge near Natchez or Knoxby Refuge near Starkville. All right, so when we talk about wading, again, obviously birds that want a body of water, would they be near lakes and that sort of thing? Yes, yeah, ponds and lakes, marshes, and they do wade, wade around in the water. They're not averse to you know getting up to their breast in water sometimes. They're looking for something to eat, little fish, little minnows, Crawfish, the white ibis like crawfish, uh, frogs, tadpoles, that sort of thing. They're they're finding food to eat in the shallows of these ponds and lakes and marshes. Uh, let's go to the phone lines uh, before our first break, and we'll talk to Sue, our friend Sue from Beaumont. Sue, you're on the air with us. Good morning. Good morning. I'd like to ask a question. Uh, do you think, does your expert think that the migration of birds will change what with the changing weather patterns will they become confused about going from warm to cold places and vice versa do you think do you think these weather patterns are going to change enough to confuse the birds okay. it's difficult to i don't have a crystal ball but it, it could i think it could i think it could affect their food you know birds have to eat constantly they're constantly eating they're always hungry and changing weather patterns could change their food I can give you an example of something that's already been observed in Europe. There's a little bird called, I believe it's called a pied flycatcher. I've never seen one. You have to go to Europe to see it. They winter in northern Africa, as I understand it, and breed in northern Europe, uh, Scandinavia, Germany, places like that. And because it's warming up sooner in northern Europe and the trees are leaving out, and the food that these little birds eat, it's a type of caterpillar, shows up earlier. So by the, t- the but the birds don't know that. So by the time they get to their breeding grounds, most of those caterpillars have already uh, are, are no longer around. They've turned into moths. So that's how the changing weather patterns could affect birds, affecting their food source or their food supplies. Okay. Does that make sense? That makes sense. Uh huh. All right, uh, Sue. Thanks for calling in this morning. 
Um, <clears throat> this is Creature Comforts on MPB Think Radio. Let's go ahead and take our next break. When we get back, we'll continue talking with Joe about some of the fall birds. Also, we'll list some of the top birding wa- bird watching apps that you could both for beginners and seasoned bird watchers. And if you have a question for Dr. Major or Joe, or you want to share your latest brush with nature, that's the phone call you need to make. It's one eight seven seven MPB Ring one eight seven seven six seven two seven four six four email animals at mpbonline.org. Stay tuned for more. Hi, I'm Jason Klein from Fix It 101. If you ever thought about changing the doorknob or fixing a leaky faucet, some jobs just aren't that difficult, and yes, you can do it. If you want to find out how to do those things, listen to Fix It 101, podcast everywhere. Kevin Farrell here with Dr. Troy Major, veterinarian at the Animal Medical Center in Jackson, and our guest for the hour, biologist Joe McGee. You're listening to Creature Comforts on MPB Think Radio. If you miss any of today's show, you can subscribe to the podcast using your favorite podcasting app or download the MPB Public Media app and you'll get to listen to all the MPB Think Radio programs on your schedule. To join the conversation this morning, it's a phone call, 1-877-MPB-RING, 1-877-672-7464. You can email animals at mpbonline.org. I want to talk about the swallowed tail kite, but we've got some callers to get to first. Let's go back to the phones and start again. Larry has called in from Boonville. Good morning, Larry. You're on the air with us. Oh, uh, I was uh, listening to your broadcast. I enjoy it. And uh, this uh, individual was asking about the disease that was in her deer herd. How bad is it now in the state of Mississippi? Can you give me any any information on that? Dr. Major, any uh, idea on the, the the deer population and, and any diseases in, in here in Mississippi? You know, we need to talk to a specialist about that. Mm-hmm. I'm honestly not sure about the, the number of deer affected. Uh, there were several counties where the uh, uh, encephalopathy, you know, where they, I guess you could call it mad deer disease, mad cow disease, uh, was occurring. But uh, he may, the caller may be referring to the uh, fact that there are deer being tested positive for COVID. Hmm. Uh, so I, I would have to say that I don't have those figures and I don't know the percentages of those. All right. I wish I could give you more information. Uh, thanks, Larry, for the call. We'll, we'll try to do a little research and maybe we can get some information for you uh, next week if, you're, if you've tuned in. So we appreciate your call this morning. going to stay on the phone lines. Brandon is next from Pontotoc. Good morning. It's your turn. Go ahead. Oh, good morning. Uh, I've got um, a comment and a question. The uh, comment is about the vultures. Mm-hmm. I live in uh, out in the county in Pontotoc on a place, old home place called Big Hill, and uh, at least once or twice a year, I have fifty to a hundred of these things we call them bo- uh, buzzards <laughs> ro- 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 roosting our trees out here, and um, quite a sight to see. And uh, Sometimes they'll sit up on the power pole and, I guess, dry their wings in the morning or something. But it's pretty pretty amazing. My dog's not real fond of them. But, uh, <laughs> they make a lot of noise. Now, the, the question, though, I have is about my best friend, Glee. She's a half um, American Pit Bull, half uh, Staffordshire Terrier. Uh, but she looks more like the dog from the Little Rascals. She's got a white coat, black patch over her eye. And she's um, been having a lot of problems. She she tries to urinate but can't she just you know takes a position to urinate and she'll sit there like that for a long time and then walk a little bit and do it again and i've taken her to the vet but we treated her with three rounds of antibiotics and she's still doing this and i feel a mass uh, in her lower abdomen and my question is this uh she's 14 years old and you know the surgery might be an option but i don't know whether that would be the best thing to try to do or not with her age and I just wanted some advice about that. Or if you have any other ideas about what might treat this, it might be something else. Right. Well, this is an excellent question. You know, it's a uh, 14-year-old. Uh, she's she's probably led a great life. I, I would say oh, this, has. though. <laughs> yeah. Did uh, did they do an ultrasound or x-ray of her bladder? They did a, they did a large x-ray. They did an x-ray initially that uh, didn't show any blockages or anything like that, no stones. But the second one they did, they she said that she thought she saw a mass uh, around the kidney. But now the mass that I can feel in her abdomen is actually more central uh, abdomen below 
almost uh, uh, well below the rib gauge. Um, and I didn't right. mention this. He also leaks at night now, but that's okay. I've got dog pads and stuff I've bought for him. But right. he leaks. And of course, this, this leakage at night is not unusual in a in an older dog that's been spayed. I'm sure she probably has been spayed, maybe not, but. Uh, Lack of estrogen uh, can cause that leakage, as you see, and can be quite a large volume from time to time. Uh, as far as the rest, you've tried three rounds of antibiotic, uh, and I'm sure probably did blood work as well. I would say maybe an ultrasound in that area you were talking about. Uh, it sounds like it could be in the... Is it in the lower abdomen or higher up? In other words, if she's standing up, is it in the lower part of her abdomen? Or central between uh, the, her rectum and her rib cage, and it's, it's pretty centralized, and it's about the size. It's not very large. It's about the size maybe of a small orange, but it's okay. a hard mass. It's, I mean, it's a, it's a palpable mass anyway. Right, and this could be you know part of the cause of why she's uh, doing what she's doing. I would say that uh, I would do an ultrasound. Though. I'd be concerned about a splenic tumor. Uh, it's not unusual uh, okay. to see that. Uh, it's possible. And uh, I, I would say, you know, I, I know you, I'm sure you love your veterinarian, but oh, you I might would, get a second opinion. I was thinking opinion. about, so, I was, yeah, thinking about Tupelo. They'd have more resources there. Right. right. And, uh, I think and a second is, opinion would kind of settle yeah. your mind as well. Okay. Well, the thing is, I mean, she's been with me for a long time, 14 years, and um, I just, I, I'm not going to put her to sleep. I've had that done once before, and I swore then I'd never do that again. Um, but I, um, if I can do something for her, if they could remove the tumor and did not, yeah. um, you know, ruin the quality of her life uh, for the remainder That's of her exactly life. That's exactly right, yes. So, and I so understand, an so. Okay. All right. It, well, might, then I'll, it might be good yeah. to get her in for a second opinion, I think. It'd be great, Okay. Okay. I appreciate your time so much. Thank you very much. All right, Brandon, uh, good welcome. to hear from Thank you. you. Thanks for the call. Uh, you know, Joe, one thing he said from, uh, on our Vulture talk it was that um, the other thing that article said was that, that sometimes it, they they kind of hang out just waiting <laughs> to get for something to die or for, you know, maybe a calf to be isolated or whatever. But again, something about these birds, I don't know why they fascinate me so, but that, that would seem kind of creepy if you go out in your field and there are a bunch of large black buzzards circling. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not sure they do that. I don't know. That may be something he picked up from mo- too many, watching too many movies. <laughs> well, you um, know me. I love to put human characteristics yeah. to these animals. But they they do. Ha- they yeah. are a, a bit social. It seems because they you s- usually see a bunch together. That's what I see. Right. Except when they nest. By the way, they they are not so social when they nest. It's just a pair of them, and they will frequently find an old house or an old barn that's falling down somewhere in Mississippi, out in the woods, away from everything. And they fly in through a hole in the roof, and they will actually nest in those old buildings. Uh, but I'm not sure they congregate waiting for someone or something to die. I, I don't think so. Joe, Joe, I had an experience what about two years ago. Uh, it was at night, and I heard all this sound in the trees and everything. And there had to be at least uh, there's a lot of pine trees there and oaks too behind the house and there were at least 150 vultures that had just settled down for the night and uh i guarantee you when they took off the next morning it sounded like a jet engine almost all those birds leaving at once mm-hmm. but they were sure migratory and just passing through and they decided that was a good place for them to stop back to the barn we had an old barn out at the farm and uh we had one vulture that would nest there every year there was a whole it wasn't a barn that was being used and uh, she would lay uh, eggs, and uh, I remember seeing the baby vultures several times, uh, and they they make a nice little hissing sound when right, you disturb them. Right, a big, and, and uh, they're white when they're young. They're, they are to- totally white as when they're born. That's hmm. correct. This is Creature Comforts on MPB Think Radio. Let's uh, next talk to Wanda, who's called in from Pontotoc this morning. Wanda, you're on the air with us. Go ahead. Hey, um, my first, co- I want to ha- make a comment, and that's that we all need to appreciate the female birds and not just the males with color. And my question is, in the spring, I had goldfinches and red-breasted grosbeaks, and I would like to know if I could expect those back at my season. 
next spring or whenever. Yes, you can. You can expect them. Yay. Yeah, you can expect the rose-breasted grosbeaks uh, in October, possibly oh. late September. But, you know, say look for them first couple of weeks in October, mid-October. They won't be quite as colorful as they were in the spring. They'll be mm-hmm. in their, uh, their what's called the basic plumage or their winter right. plumage. But, you know, it's not winter where they're going, but uh, the males will look more like the females uh, right. in October. But, and they'll come to your feeder again if you've got sunflower seeds out. Was that what they were eating before, black sunflower? Yes. Yeah. So, Mostly. Yeah, f- so for sure you can see the rose-breasted grosbeaks in, in the fall. And then a little later, you should see the uh, American goldfinches. And once again, they won't be quite as bright uh, in, the, right. in the fall and winter as they were in the spring when you saw them. Uh, the males and the females, will it'll be difficult to tell them apart at that time of the year. But yeah, you should see these again, spring and fall. Thank you so much. Yeah. I appreciate it. All yeah. right. Thanks, Wanda, for your call. Uh-huh. Uh, Let's stay on the phone lines. Next, we'll go to Polly, who's from Covington, Louisiana. Good morning, Polly. You're on the air. Hey. How are y'all? We're doing good. What do you have for us today? I have a question about what I feed my birds. Um, It sounds silly, but I I hate to throw any food away. I like to recycle. So sometimes I give them popcorn, and sometimes I give them potato chips, and they love it. But is that Is that hurting them in any way? I doubt that it's hurting them. It might not be the best thing to feed them uh, because those items, those food items, potato chips and popcorn could attract some animals that you don't want around, uh, like possums possibly. But if you don't object to possums, why not? Uh, yeah, I don't they think, eat I don't, it so quickly. They, I, I mean, it's gone in, in 10 or 15 minutes. They just are you a, Are you able to identify the birds that are eating those those food items? Yeah, blue jays, oh. uh, titmouse, um, okay, yeah. redbird, yeah. robins. Yeah, the usual uh, suspects, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, don't, just, I don't think it's hurting anything. I would not feed them moldy food. That, you know, they no. don't like moldy, spoiled food any more than no, we do. No. Yeah, don't do that. But I think I think it's okay. I wouldn't give them a steady diet of that. Uh, no, I don't. It's yeah. just when I have leftover. Right, but right. But they're, they're so cute, the little robins will share a kernel. <laughs> and the, I just love watching them. And then the blue jays will swoop down and pick up a kernel and take it up in the tree right. and gnaw on it. But um, as long as I'm not hurting them, I'm just enjoying watching them. <laughs> I, don't think so. I don't think so. Okay. All right. Well, Thank you. Thanks, Polly, for your call. This is Creature Comforts on MPB Think Radio. Before our next break, Joe, let's talk about the swallow-tailed kite that has been called the coolest bird on the planet. Uh, Some people think that, and I'm I'm one of them, I guess. Uh, They are still rare in Mississippi, and I have to admit, here this morning, I have not seen one this year. By this time last year, I had seen over 20. Hmm. But they migrate through Mississippi in August. this is the last opportunity to see them. Uh, by first week in September, they will have all left the state. But, yeah, it's a beautiful bird. Uh, some birders consider it a, a near religious experience to see <laughs> the first time they see one. And I, I, it was a long time before I ever saw one, and I was driving up uh, Interstate 59 years ago, and I saw one up ahead high, high in the sky, just almost just a dot. I, I pulled over on the shoulder had my binoculars, and I looked at it, but that wasn't a very satisfactory look. And then the next time I saw one, uh, it was near the Pascagoula River. Beautiful bird, black on the upper parts, white, but usually you see it from below, so you, it, it looks like a white bird, uh, white head with uh, you know black uh, upper parts. So is it the <clears throat> relative, obs- not obscurity, I'm not sure is the right word, but is it the, the look of the bird and the fact that people rarely ever see it is why I guess people get so excited I, when they do see it? I think so. It's, it's rarely seen. Their numbers may be inching up a little bit uh, nowadays. It used to uh, breed as far north as Minnesota, but you know it's been decades since that happened. But it's this beautiful angelic bird, if you will. If you know what a barn swallow looks like, a small passerin bird, a small perching bird, uh, the swallow-tailed kite gets its name from the sw- from the barn swallow. It has a deeply forked tail, okay. and uh, 
it's like a giant barn swallow. It, right. They have a wingspan of near over four feet, a little mm-hmm. over a little over four feet. That's a big bird. Mm-hmm. That's larger than a red-shouldered hawk. So, uh, this is Creature Comforts. Time for our last break of the hour. If you want to join our conversation, let us know what birds you have in your yard. Give us a call with questions and comments and observations. It's one eight seven seven MPB ring. It's one eight seven seven. 672-7464 or email animals at mpbonline.org During the short break, see if you can find out what year the mockingbird became Mississippi's official state bird. They can be found in urban areas around the state, but what year did it officially become the state bird? We've got that answer for you after the break, so stay tuned. back on Creature Comforts on MPB Think Radio. This is Kevin Farrell with our guest for the day, Joe McGee. If you want to join the conversation, still time to work in a quick phone call at one eight seven seven mpb ring It's one 672 7464 Before the break, we talked about uh, the mockingbird becoming Mississippi's official state bird and asked if you knew what year. Pat yourself on the back if you said 1944. The Women's Federated Clubs of Mississippi held a state bird campaign and selected the Mockingbird. The legislature the legislature made it law on February 23, 1944. Uh, the Mockingbird is also the state bird symbol of Florida, Texas, Tennessee, and Arkansas. So, back to the phone lines we go. We start in Learned. Nancy's called in today. Good morning. You're on the air with us. Hello. Hi. Uh, hi. This is Nancy from Learned. Yeah, go ahead. How are y'all? Okay, um, I want to make a comment about a swallowtail kite. I'm lucky enough to live in an area that I can see them frequently. It's just a bit southwest of Raymond, and anytime they've got bush hogging going on, you can go over and see, I mean, up to 50 Mississippi kites, and and they've seen between six and eight swallowtail kites. Um, And I was driving down uh, Highway 18 oh, about two weeks ago and saw two um, flying with a group of Mississippi kites, and it is a religious experience. Um, it's just wonderful. All right, uh, Nancy, thanks for calling in with uh, that observation. And, Joe, I think during the break <clears throat> you were talking about one of your uh, sightings, and you said that it was when people were haying, you know, guys making some hay, and she said that the bush hogging. Yes. So you're saying that maybe stirs up uh, insects or it's, something that would attract them? It stirs up large insects. Swallowtail kites are known, and Mississippi kites as well, are known to feed on large insects. And yes, last year I had the opportunity of seeing uh, some fellows, uh, the hay had already been cut several days before, and they were raking the hay, and that really stirs up the insects. And a flock of swallowtail kites were following the hay rake around. The tractor and you know pulling the hay rake, mm-hmm. and uh, they had uh, notified me by email uh, by text that uh, that they were seeing all these kites, and they sent me a picture. When they weren't sure what the, they thought they were some kind of seabird, they didn't know exactly what they were. Uh, but I appreciated them letting me know. Uh, I just wish I had asked the guy if I could ride the tractor <laughs> with him so I could try to get a really good picture. But yes, they the bush hogs will. Uh, stir up insects which in, and exposes the insects, mm-hmm. which in turn uh, brings in the kites. As, uh, as Nancy was saying, she lives, she's really lucky to live where she lives to see all the... I bet there's swamps uh, in the area where she lives. Back to the phone lines we go. This time it's Hugh calling from Ocean Springs. Good morning, Hugh. You're on the air with us. Yes, good morning. Uh, my question has to do with a bird bath. Um, well, I just put up a bird bath, and I was thinking, well, maybe I, I would uh, seal it so it doesn't absorb as much water and maybe not crack over the winter. It freezes occasionally down here. And uh, then I realized, well, wait, before I poison the birds because the sealant may contaminate the water? It might. I, I, I don't know what, what's in the sealant, but it could leach out into the water. Is the bird bath made of concrete? Yeah, yeah, it's a cement thing. Yeah, mine, I have a bird bath that's made, it's a, it's a shallow dish made out of concrete, uh, and mine is not sealed, uh, 
and it works fine. It, on the nights when the temperature is going to really drop, and I know it's going to be way below freezing, I get all the water out of my bird bath so it's dry overnight, and then I add more the next day. I have to add it with a take a jug of water out because the I don't you know the pipes are turned off. Um, oh yeah, yeah. I mean, that's, but I, total, I, yeah, I would I'd be careful about putting a sealant in there. Uh, just fill it every day with fresh water. And you, have you got a dripper on it? I I have a dripper on my bird bath, and it really brings in the birds. Well, I I've thought about using a gallon jug, you know, seal it up and poke a little hole and. I don't have a water line to it, but I thought, well, maybe this would work. But I thought about the a dripper thing. Yeah, mm-hmm. a, a, a jug can. I've done that before. It tends to spew out in a little stream, and that, and as it as the jug becomes empty, the stream uh, increases. It decreases as the. Oh. You see what I mean? Because there's, no, there's less water pressure. Yeah. So it doesn't work as well over time. You could try a jug or a bucket, but one of the little drippers, they're not too expensive. They're available from Wild Birds Unlimited, and I'm sure online's got them. And uh, that that moving water, that sound of dripping water really brings in the birds. The other day, I, I couldn't believe the number. I had bluebirds, summer tanagers, uh, oh, what else? There were uh, there was a white-eyed vireo came to the feeder, uh, to the birdbath. Uh <coughs> Cardinals. It, it was it was a colorful sight to see. All right, uh, Hugh. We appreciate your call. Let's get one final call from the day in, and it's Steve, who's in Jackson. Good morning, Steve. You're on the air with us. Hey, yeah, I have a quick question. Uh, last year, we we live on the trace, the Natchez Trace, our backyard, and we had these two birds show up for a few days. And one was yellow, like a canary yellow, and the other was a reddish orange. Just from head to toe, you I know, mean, not toes, but you know, the, all the feathers. And they were beautiful, and they hung around for a little while. And then I've never seen anything like that before. Any idea? I I do have an idea. Let me ask you a couple of questions first. You say one of them was yellow. One was yellow. Was it popsicle yellow? Uh, was that mainly on the underside, on the breast and the belly, or do you remember? It was um, it was yellow on the. I'm not sure about the underside. It might have been a, some white, but the. Mainly yellow, just a, a light yellow, a pretty yellow color. And it was, it was a nice size bird, too. Like yeah, but about, the, size. about what size? Like a red bird. or Okay, like yeah, yeah, all right. And the other bird was sort of orangey red, you said? Orange, orangey red, real pretty. Where, you know, like, but, but not a red bird, not a, not yeah. a cardinal. Do you think these that. were the same species? Or I think the, so. I, I, think, they were I think what you were seeing were summer tanagers. Okay, all right. Ch- ch- go online, check with wild... Uh, all about birds. Are you familiar yeah. with that website or field guide? I bet you yeah. you were seeing a, a male and female summer tanager. The, okay. the males are sort of a tomato red. There's a little bit of orange in it. Yeah, that's probably more a better color. Yeah. And they have. Next time you see one, look for the look at the bill. They have a fairly heavy bill, a uh, real okay. thick, heavy bill. Are they from this area? Or they, they breed in. Birds? They do breed in Mississippi. Yeah, summer tanagers breed in Mississippi, but they're one of the neotropical migrants. They're leaving now. They're on their way south. Okay. I can't see anything this year, but that was that was, all of a sudden they were there. Do you have a bird bath per chance? We do. We had a bird bath, and and at, we have a feeder too. I don't know if we're feeding. We have a hummingbird feeder and the, the other feeder too. I don't know if we're feeding birds at that time. They're not. They're not. They don't eat seed. They'll come to uh, fruit. Uh, if you have a way of putting cut an orange in half and put that out, they'll come to that. All right, Steve, thanks for the call. We're out of time here. Just want to quickly mention the bird watching apps. We uh, teased that but never got to talk about it. But uh, iBird Pro Guide to Birds, Merlin Bird ID, Audubon Bird Guide, and Peterson's Birds of North America, a couple that you might want to try out. Creature Comforts is a production of Mississippi Public Broadcasting Think Radio, funding provided in part by listeners like you. To hear today's show or a previous show, you can find it at mpbonline.org slash creature comforts. Our show is produced by Java Chapman, and our call screener was Liz Gill. So for Dr. Major and our guest Joe McGee, I'm Kevin Farrell, inviting you to stay tuned. Up next, it's AutoCorrect with the lady auto mechanic, Allison Walker. We'll be back next Thursday at 9 for Creature Comforts, heard only 